Welcome back. We're talking about the fatal shooting of an unarmed teenager, a black teenager in the U.S. Midwestern town of Ferguson, Missouri, and the fallout demonstrations, some of them turning violent, taking place in that city. With me are Bernard Kerrick, the former New York police chief, as well as Richard Fowler, a national talk show host. Gentlemen, welcome back. Uh, Bernard, let me start with you. When these demonstrations started out after the shooting, we had three nights of violent demonstrations. Mm -hmm. The fourth night, Thursday night, it was peaceful. It was a peaceful march. In fact, the police chief took part in the demonstration as well. What changed from the third night to the fourth night? Communications. It, it, you know, the Ron Johnson, the new commander uh, appointed by the governor from the state police came in and went out to the community. As Richard said, he went to the high school. He spoke to the community leaders. And then, most importantly, the, big, the, the most important thing to me, he said last night, Every morning, I'm going to hold a press conference, and I'm going to let you know what we're doing, how we're doing it, why we're doing it, things like that. That's the most important dynamic to handling a crisis like this, because otherwise nobody knows what's going on. And, and that communication is extremely important. And he took that step. I think the public, the community realized it, and, uh, and it made a, an enormous, enormous difference. Right, Richard, as you said, you know, when we look at how the police handled the demonstrations, uh, and as you argued, it could be an assault on the constitutional rights of people to demonstrate and to say what they feel. Uh, Congress has taken note of that. I mean, there is opinion changing in the country that responded to that. We hear now that some legislation that had been on the table uh, to demilitarize the police, as they've said, is now going to be pushed through. It's going to be pushed through by a congressman from Georgia. So. Is that a good first, first step? I think it is, it, it is a good first step. And, and I want to go back just to one thing. And I, and I think it's very important to sort of recognize here that the, these, these protesters, right, these individuals who were fighting for justice for Michael Brown, right, they were peaceful protests. I think where the violence came in is when the battle ram showed up, the rubber bullets, tear gassing the crowd, tear gassing Al, Al Jazeera, Al, the Al Jazeera news crew was tear gassed. That is where the violence took place. And I think always, and I think Dr. King says this best, violence begets violence. So when you see the police department show up with tanks in the streets, of course the people are going to be outraged. And I think you, no matter what race you are, just take a page out of, like, put yourself in Ferguson for just a second and imagine you're sitting in your house watching the evening news and a battle tank rolls by your house as if you're living in Afghanistan or Iraq. I can imagine that you, you would be upset you would be angry, and that would draw you to the streets to demand change, too. And I think that is what, you know, and that's what's sort of hap happening in Ferguson. But I, I don't think for any second that we could just look at Ferguson in a vacuum and on. We have to take Ferguson outside the vacuum and see what, what needs to be done overall. One, demilitarizing the police. But two, how do we work on creating a better relationship between police departments across the country and the African-American community and, to the farther extent, um, the Latino community and the brown community in this country? Because I think what, 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 what the situation we have, this is the powder keg waiting to explode. Will there be another Ferguson tomorrow? Possibly. Right? Will another police officer make a bad decision if that's what we deemed happened after the court, after the case goes through and another unarmed black guy dies? Possibly. But what's going to happen the next time to make it different? How can we make sure this doesn't happen again? And I think that is a conversation as a nation that we need to have. Okay. Bernard, in the search for that uh, conversation that Richard is talking about, is it going to be necessary for there to be uh, strong accountability here for what happened? Yeah, I think so. I think so. You, you know, the, obviously there was a problem um, that the governor wasn't happy with. Uh, the governor made change, um, appointed somebody else to take over the security for Ferguson for the, uh, for the protest. Um, and I think the governor is going to look at it, uh, as well as the other state and local officials. Uh, they're going to have to look at it. Uh, was it handled correctly? Um, and what are the lessons learned as a result of what happened? And this goes back to Richard's thing. I think there's a bigger dynamic, uh, a bigger conversation that has to be had. But it's all going to start in Ferguson, and it should sort of, you know, swell out from there. Uh, Richard, I mean, this has become, uh, you know, racially charged, as we can see. Um, is that? I mean, that's a historic problem. That didn't stop this week, right? No, it didn't start this week. And I think, you, you know, there was an interesting piece that was written. I can't remember exactly where it was, but it, it made a very good point, right? A police officer, well, and it, it has everything to do with past experiences and past relationships that bring you to the point where we are right now. Police officer walks up to an African-American person on the street. Immediately, the police 
they, they have a certain, I mean, I'm not saying all police officers, but there's a certain view on both sides. On the African-American side, there's an issue. We don't, there's a lot of folks who say they don't like the police. So you'll hear comments, quote unquote, we hate the police, right? And then the same goes, there's this attitude and there's this disparity there that we've got to fix, right? The police use sometimes use excessive force. The police come with an attitude. You respond with an attitude, right? Like I said at the beginning, as, as MLK would say, it violence begets violence, attitudes beget attitudes. So the question is, is how do we work on fixing that? How do we work on changing the relationship? That is going to be the most important thing, and that is the one thing that we need to take from what happened in Ferguson. And think about it, it's not the first time. In Sanford, we saw the same thing, right, where the police did one thing, the community responded another way, and it became this us versus them. And, and the truth of the matter is, is that we're all in it together. The police protect our streets, and we live on our streets. Right. But one of the biggest reasons we hear for the poor relationship between police and especially black communities, Hispanic communities, actually takes place in New York. Uh, and you would know that. You were commissioner of the city there, the chief of police. Uh, New York has the stop and frisk laws. Mm -hmm. And they say that it's been unfairly used against minority groups in the city. And that has led to a very poor relationship developing between police and minorities. Well, look, in my opinion, stop and frisk is a tool, like any other police tool. If it's used properly, it's extremely beneficial. Nobody has sustained more safety and security in New York City than the black community. No one. Homicide rates are down 70, 75% over the last 20 years. Violent crime down 80% over the last 20 years. Those numbers are specifically in the black community. Um, stop and frisk abused, there's a problem. People have to be held accountable. Officers have to know what they can do. There has to be a tracking system to ensure that it's not being abused. Uh, to completely eliminate it, it takes a lot of the uh, ability of the cops that go out there and, and stop and frisk is basically all about looking for guns, looking for weapons, looking for real bad guys to take off the street. You take that ability away from the cops, you're going to have a problem. <laughs> Listen, I think on paper, stop and frisk, and, and I agree, I think possibly as a tool and maybe um, and on paper it looks good, but how it was implemented in the city of New York was absolutely awful. African American and Latino men were stopped numerous times, over 100 percent of times they were stopped, right, and frisked for no reason. And I think what, it real, what, what stop and frisk does, and I think Benjamin Franklin said it best, like you, you debate freedom versus security and what's that balance, right? And I think the, the Constitution really hangs in the balance here. And I think from time to time people break it in case of emergency. And stop and frisk is one of those cases where they broke the Constitution uh, and, and, they, and they really really, really, really devastated the community and why the relationship is so bad in New York between the police department and the African-American community is because of that. People feel as though they're being profiled, right? They feel as though that their liberties are being trampled upon, and that's the problem. I think where police and the community can work together is making sure that we push back and fight against organizations like the NRA, which want to make sure that people have enough weapons to blow up the Taliban, right? So right. if we can start, well, let's start there and let's work together to get rid of, get the guns off the streets and change the laws to get the guns off the streets, but really inflicting the pain of guns on the streets on innocent black and brown boys is a huge problem. Okay, that's where we're going to have to leave it. You get the last word. Gentlemen, thanks to both of you, Thank Richard you, Fowler, Bernard Kerrick. Thanks for joining us.